Day one of the NBA season is in the books, and we had two games, one very good game and a second game uh, that I will get to in a minute. But first, the Philadelphia 76ers went into Boston, and it was a tale of two halves, really. The first half, the Celtics just could not stop the 76ers' offense. James Harden looked straight out of a time machine, and Bede was fully taking advantage of early foul trouble that Al Horford got in, which made the Celtics resort to kind of a rotation of Blake Griffin, Grant Williams, and Noah Vonley manning the center for them. And Embiid looked like he was going to have one of those huge days. Harden was getting all the free throw calls. Harden looked like vintage Harden here. And for a second, you could see the vision. You could see the vision that the 76ers fans have been talking themselves into all offseason. And then the second half came around, and Boston, they just turned up the intensity. We had a lot more defense. There was a lot more pressure on the ball. They were able to cut off a lot of passes and open lanes for the 76ers which is all stuff that they should have been able to do because they were um, a historically great defense last season from about New Year's Day through the playoffs. They were historically great. And they did not lose anyone of note in their rotation. And in fact, they brought in another elite level perimeter defender in Malcolm Brogdon, who looked like a thousand times better than I even predicted. I knew he was going to look good on this team because he's just a good, smart player. But to see him fit in and know exactly where to be and where to put the ball, where everyone wanted that wanted the ball to be, he, he played out of his mind. And having him come off the bench to give Derek White, Marcus Smart, and then Jalen Brown maybe if he's handling uh, playmaking duties, to have someone that you can rely on to come in and keep the level of play that high is going to be huge for Boston. Uh, the thing that they're going to need to figure out is that center position because fortunately there's only a few top, top, top tier centers that they have to worry about like in the true sense of the word. But you don't want to put that mileage on Al Horford really. And for the 76ers, like I said, everyone looked like they had a really good game. Uh, Harden, Vintage Knight, 35, 7, and 8. Joel Embiid, 26 and 15. Tobias Harris, 18 really efficient points on 7 of 14 shooting. Everything looked good, but the 76ers in the second half just kind of got outpaced. Like the Celtics looked like they wanted to run, and the 76ers looked like they had no interest whatsoever in keeping up with them. So that's going to be something that's going to be interesting to watch because Harden, obviously, a lot is always made about his weight and his conditioning, and Embiid, a lot is made about the mileage that they put on his body and him breaking down in the playoffs uh, the last couple seasons, just kind of getting overwhelmed with all of the minutes. So I really don't know what the uh, what the option's going to be. Like They don't have the young players in place outside of Tyrese Maxey, really, to like let the second unit be the group that just runs up and down the court. So I don't know if there's a, a trade in there somewhere involving like a Tobias Harris, but... They're a team that, obviously, I think I said this the other day too, the regular season doesn't quite fully matter for them. Like, obviously, they want home court advantage. They want to be a top team. But the playoffs are where <laughs> all of their reputation is going to be staked. They could have a, a franchise record in wins this year, and it's not going to matter if they don't make it past the second round or something, you know? So... That one was a really good game. The Celtics were kind of able to ice it late with a really strong defense and clutch shooting, clutch playmaking from Jason Tatum. And the Jays, Jason and Jalen, combined for 70 points. And, like, I had no idea. Watching that game, like, I could tell Tatum was going off. But, like, Jalen Brown, it was, like, the sneakiest 35 points I've ever seen. I couldn't believe it when that stat came up. And that's going to be the recipe for them, is, is count on those role players to fill in, find someone that can take over and handle those minutes so Al Horford can rest, and as you wait for Rob Williams to get back, and just kind of hold course until you get your team back to full strength, and then kind of ramp up to, to hopefully be peaking right as you go into the playoffs. Now, there's another game. It was ring night in Golden State. The Warriors took on the Los Angeles Lakers, who were looking to play spoiler. And after the first half, really, honestly, looked okay. Like, I was pleasantly surprised. The Lakers were 
were able to hang with them for the most part. Um, all three of the, the big stars for the Lakers had pretty good games. Uh, LeBron, AD, and Westbrook. And then that was kind of it for the contributions that they got. And it's kind of sad to be sitting here as a Lakers fan saying, you know, they really missed the outside shooting when all anyone's been saying for basically two years, basically since the bubble title, is, hey, this is a team that just needs shooters around LeBron. Now you have Anthony Davis. Guess what? Let's get shooters about around LeBron and AD now. Problem solved. There we go. And for some reason, it just hasn't happened. I don't know why Rob Polinka got a contract extension without signing any real shooters. Uh, for today, the team went 10 of 40 from 3. LeBron was 3 of 10 from 3. Anthony Davis was 0 for 3. <laughs> and it, it just, it was not good. Kendrick Nunn looked good in limited minutes. 3 of 6 from 3. Provided a bit of a steady hand off the bench, but that's not going to cut it. Obviously, the thing hanging over this team is going to be the two first-round picks and Russell Westbrook trade that is just going to be waiting out there for a team that feels like tanking for Victor Wembanyama. They're going to wait and see probably the best that they can get. But if this is the the way it's going to go up until then, that uh, that Buddy Heald Miles Turner package is going to start looking a lot better. Unfortunately, like if they play it and stay patient, they might be able to get more than that. But that's a big ask because this was this was pretty tough to watch, and honestly, the defense was where it where it really got exposed because the Warriors put together a 23 to four run in the third quarter. It's what they do is the third quarter run and the Lakers just didn't have an answer. The Warriors outscored them 23 to four in like six minutes. It was incredible. It was incredible to watch Steph Curry rare form as usual started really slow and then just kind of heated up. Same thing with Klay Thompson who was held to just 20 minutes because Steve Kerr has been um, easing some players back in. Uh, Draymond Green, four points, five assists, five rebounds. Uh, kind of just a typical Draymond game here now. And the Warriors looked like they just did not miss a beat. All of the young players contributed meaningfully, which is even more terrifying to the league. You look at Moses Moody, Jonathan Kaminga, Andrew Wiggins, who now just can hit step-back threes. Like, he's just added step-back threes to his arsenal a lot more consistently. Jordan Poole, everyone that they were counting on, even James Wiseman came in and was, like, banging bodies with Anthony Davis and anyone that tried to get into the paint for the Lakers. He only had, uh, like, seven, eight points, seven rebounds. But, like, that's pretty big. That's pretty big to be able to count on him to come in and hold it down against the other team's center for 20 minutes, you know? Uh, Kaminga struggled with his shot a little bit. Moses Moody looked a little bit more comfortable. But again, the two of them, you don't really worry about the scoring when you're deploying lineups with like Steph Clay and Jordan Poole or some combination of those two. You're using, you're needing those guys to basically come up big with their athleticism. And that's exactly what they did. They were energetic. They were athletic. They hustled. Uh, Kaminga had an incredible steal where he basically... Uh, Saw Russell Westbrook looking to the corner for a kick out for three. And he just put on the afterburners and just was somehow able to get a hand up and disrupt it. Wasn't able to save it from out of bounds, but it was incredible. It was an incredible play because he came from like the half court mark and caught up to the play in time to stop it from being essentially a wide open three attempt. And that kind of was just it. The third quarter kind of really put it away. The Lakers started to look like they were making it interesting in the fourth quarter. Steve Kerr kind of just put the starters back in. And within like two minutes, it was back to a 16, 17 point lead. Uh, and I'm kind of concerned that this is what it's going to be for the Lakers here now. Up until they, they do make whatever trade is on the books. Because next up, we have a game against the LA Clippers this Thursday, I believe. Which, who knows, because those matchups can sometimes go either way. Those cross, those rivalries, who knows. But I'm not exactly optimistic after seeing what the Warriors players did. 
and thinking about all the depth that the Clippers have that they can throw. Granted, the Clippers are an older team, but they have the type of depth and shooting that the Lakers just don't. So we will see. It'll probably be an early start or a, a long start to the early part of the season. Um, fingers crossed something manifests because I think there was some encouraging things here for sure. Namely, just LeBron James, year 20, looking just as good as ever. Anthony Davis looked a lot more like the Anthony Davis uh, we saw in the preseason and not last year. He was diving for loose balls. He was battling for rebounds. He was holding his ground on defense. He had a soft touch at the rim. Jumper fell a little bit. But the thing that bothered me with AD is the fourth quarter, I think he only had one rebound. Close to seven feet tall, and he finished with six rebounds for the game. And I believe three or four of those were in the first quarter where he was playing like a man possessed, just trying to get to the rim. Uh, the player who obviously will probably be under the most scrutiny here is actually probably the one who doesn't deserve it, maybe deserves it the least, is Russell Westbrook. His name has been on in all the trade talks. He's he's been the one usually to uh, to receive the ire from the fans and the blame for for the team struggles. And I thought he did really well here. I thought he had a really good game. Seven to twelve, four for five from the free throw line, one of three from three. Which the fact that he's cutting down on jump shots and shot attempts is an encouraging sign. Finished with nineteen points. 11 rebounds, 3 assists, so a pretty efficient game for him. Uh, the assist number being low, kind of surprising considering how well he usually is at, at finding the open shooter, but that is also just a testament to this team missing so many threes. I think he probably could have been closer to 7 or 8 assists, honestly, if some of those jumpers had fallen. But this was a really efficient game for him. 31 minutes, uh, as I said, 7 to 12, and... It kind of doesn't matter because he just does not fit with what the team is is needing to be. The team is needing to be shooters around LeBron and AD who can space the floor a bit more and allow them to go to work in the paint and to pick other teams apart with their elite playmaking and their elite vision. And Russ is like taking a hurricane and just dropping it in the middle of a basketball game. <laughs> like... Russ is, Russ is the basketball Tasmanian devil. Like, he is just on the court. He's a menace. He's out to, to play hard and just go at you at every second of the game. He is not trying to be friendly. He's trying to basically just destroy you, and that's it. And, you know, that helps a lot of teams when the team has the assets and everything to fit that. Like, you think about why Houston was so good with Russ and Harden in the second half of their one season together. And it's because they literally traded away the centers on the team that were disrupting the flow of the offense that Russ could run. They were like, hey, let's take the center out. And then all of a sudden, Russ was averaging like 30 and 8 a game. Like he went crazy for a little bit there. Same thing with Washington. Bradley Beal kind of struggles, gets hurt, and Russell Westbrook goes, hey, I'm going to drag this team to the playoffs because it's just four people that can stand around and watch me be athletic and know where to be when I'm going to make this pass. And the Lakers just aren't that. So I'm fully, fully confident that, say he gets traded to the Pacers, they're tanking for Wembenyama at this point, who knows. They wave Russ, buy Russ out, whatever. He's going to go somewhere, and he's going to be really good. And they're going to sit back and say that this was, you know, an example of how bad LeBron is to play with or, or this or that. And it's truly just a, a meshing of styles that just does not work. Uh, it's an unfortunate thing because I really do um, appreciate Russ. I enjoy watching him play and I appreciate just how much heart he puts into the game every time he's out on the court. But it's just not a fit. It's just not working. I hope wherever he goes, whenever a, a trade does hopefully happen, I hope he goes somewhere where he can show out and he can prove that it, he's not washed, that it is just a fit thing. And, you know, sometimes that's okay. It doesn't work the way you wanted it to. It doesn't work the way you thought it might. But the important part here now is the Lakers are going to be up against the wall. LeBron signed an extension for uh, a year and a player option. AD, who knows how long he's going to be healthy. You have to maximize that. And then that's it. They don't have picks. 
They don't have picks, and if they do this Westbrook trade, they're not going to have picks until, like, the 2030 season. So this is it. It's win with what we have and figure out ways to improve on the margins where it's possible maybe through trade. Or the future is pretty, pretty bleak. So I don't know. This is one game. Obviously, it's it's silly to overreact over one game even though i have a lot of fun doing it i think it's you know it's part of just fandom is having those high expectations and voicing those frustrations through the highs and the lows but it's only one game 81 more to go surely it cannot just be this for 81 games uh, i'm gonna knock on wood on that one because really you never know so I think that's everything for the two games. If you had thoughts about Lakers-Warriors or if you had thoughts about um, Boston-Philadelphia, let me know in the comments what you thought. Uh, we have a full slate of games on deck for Wednesday, which will be great to have back. Um, so look forward to watching those. Probably won't do a recap unless something crazy happens, uh, in which case I'll probably be back a little bit later in the week with another video. But in the meantime... Appreciate everyone watching. Have a good day. Enjoy the games tonight, and I will be back.